Hello there. So in the last video, we took a look at the CPU model and we reasoned that the CPU was essentially a bunch of uh, registers. As seen from the programmer's uh, standpoint, the CPU can be viewed as a, a register file or a set of register files one being the GPR, the general purpose registers, and the other being the SFRs or the CFRs, special function registers and configuration registers, respectively. So now what, uh, and, and well, before we move forward, and what we also mentioned was that there was a, a address bus and a data bus on which uh, and then there was like a read write bar uh, so on uh, on the buses the cpu requested the memory for data and the data could be interpreted as a code as well depending on what uh, the cpu wants to do with it and then we also reasoned that there would be uh, something called interrupts and uh, i mentioned that we would discuss a lot more about these a little bit later so now what we want to do as part of this video is take a look at um, the relation between CPU, memory, uh, and instruction, right? So we are going to take a look at uh, these three. Now, before we even, you know, jump into this, I kind of want to take, uh, take a moment to propose a modification to our uh, models so far right so modification and at, at this point we are kind of getting a little away from the original 1970s model that we discussed so the modification is this so in the 1970s model we had again the cpu the memory uh, the CPU address bus going to the memory and data bus, you know, going between the memory and CPU and the CPU sending over um, the read, write, bar signals, right? And so we mentioned that this is the address bus again, right? Address bus and this is the, the data bus. Now the modification is that I mentioned that this, the, uh, the data bus the data bus would return back data that the CPU can either treat as the data to do computation on, or it can treat it like a instruction, like an instruction, right? And so we saw that the same bus was fetching the data and fetching the instruction. Of course, when I say all of this about the data and the instruction, uh, know that, or just to you know reiterate that writing the data back to the memory was also allowed but writing an instruction wasn't right and we could fetch data or we could fetch instruction now the proposal is what we'll do and what we do will actually simplify um, you know the reasoning a lot a uh, lot better going forward and the proposal is this that we now have two separate set of buses one for data only and one for um, one for instructions, right? So, okay, so I need to make one more correction, which is if I am saying that we have two sets of buses and this is CPU and this is the memory and of course this extra line going for read and write inverted or right bar now the thing is what i'm what i'm proposing is this set of buses okay and i should because these are buses i should cross these out uh, just because a, a, a line and a cross represents a bus bus means many wires right so the blue one here is instruction address and the instruction data bus, 
Okay, what does that mean? So it means that the CPU will float the address to fetch an instruction on this bus and then get back the instruction on this bus. Right, it's, it's separate. And this part here is only for data read, right? Right, and this, this also consists of the data okay just a moment so it consists of the data address bus which is this and it contains the data bus which is this so essentially what we have done is in this model we have um, separated the instruction fetch and data manipulation right and what this will do is this will this will help us separate the discussion about instructions and data you know uh, this model is also valid uh, in fact, it is called the von Neumann architecture and the bottom one is called the Harvard architecture. Right. So when you use the same buses for instruction and data, uh, that is von Neumann. And when you use uh, separate uh, buses for instruction and data, uh, that is uh, Harvard architecture. Right. So this this was one of the modifications to our model that we wanted to make. And again, uh, this separation or this modification uh, in the model of the CPU and the memory interaction, uh, that will be useful to us in terms of reasoning about the instructions better and reasoning about the data manipulation better. That is why we have separated this and we will move on, you know, forward with this model. Okay, now, so coming back to our topic, which was CPU instructions and the memory. So the idea then is what is going on? How, what is the CPU doing? All right, and how is it interacting with the memory? Okay, so let me, right. Okay, so let's uh, again, recall that the CPU was a bunch of registers, register files. And in the previous video, I mentioned that there was a special function register uh, called the program counter, right? So this is called the program counter. So the CPU essentially has one register dedicated to point to the memory where the instruction is present, right? So you have this memory here, and let me just have memory cells and then let me just uh, okay let me just uh, put some addresses and if you see i'm assuming that the memory access width is four bytes so in the previous video we mentioned that each register here is uh, eight bits or one byte so I was mentioning that each cell is one byte, but to make our discussion easier, let's assume that the instruction is four bytes, right? So let's assume that, the, uh, uh, okay. Let's assume that the memory here is four registers together, right? Something like this. So what this is then is this much is one byte. So I'm just keeping them arranged as four bytes uh, rows, but they are uh, you know one byte each and four of them in each row. So then we have addresses that go something like this and then so on and so forth, right? Okay, and this was again our GPR, the general purpose registers, which we in the previous uh, video named like so, right? So now, the thing is that we have, let's just consider the instruction bus. Right? So we have the address going here and the instruction coming back here, right? 
Okay, so now the way CPUs boot up is that they have this program counter set to a set value by default. So when you power them up, power the CPU up, uh, the program counter would have certain default value. And that value in this case, let's say is zero. So then the program counter by default is pointing and not the keyword pointing because this will come back again in the C language. So it is pointing to the zeroth address, right? And then the idea is now that the zeroth address would have some bits combination. And the moment we boot the CPU up, what it is going to do is it is going to put this program counter value on the address, instruction address bus. So what we have on the address bus then is the zeros, zero zero address. So in return, let, let's say this content was uh, X, Y, Z, Q, for example, you know, each byte was something like so. Or actually, let me make it more relevant. So let's make it uh, hex A, B, C, D. Let's say the content here was hex A, B, C, D. So now what will happen is hex A, B, C, D will appear here. Right. And now this appears in, or this is fetched inside the CPU. So CPU has, in this case, fetched the first instruction, right? And how is how is uh, the CPU knowing when to do what? Uh, remember the notion of clock. So with every clock tick, the CPU internally, the circuitry, will conspire to achieve these. Uh, you know, set of actions, which is take the program counter, put it on the address bus, send it over to the memory, wait for the memory. Uh, once the content from the memory is received back, process it, right? So this, this, this entire sequence here of taking the program counter, putting it onto the address bus, going over to the memory, taking the content, coming back uh, within the CPU, coming back the uh, of the data within the CPU, the instruction in this case this is called the instruction fetch so i've been referring to phases in which or phase in which the cpu is right uh, previously i was mentioning that you know the address is floated and the data coming back is either an instruction or a data depending on the phase that the cpu is in and instruction fetch is one of those phases that's what i was hinting at right so instruction fetch is uh, one of the phases and now let's look at what happens after the instruction fetch so we have this data bus where our instruction data bus that gave us hex a b c d that that had hex a b c d base uh, on it so this will be fetched into another register internally called the instruction buffer. So the instruction buffer is where, you know, all of that data is saved in. And now the story becomes interesting from this point. So, and we will go into a lot more details of this particular stage in, in, in another video. But what I want uh, to draw your attention to is this value here becomes the seed for different circuits within the uh, within the CPU. And those circuits are, let's say, the control unit and ALU. So looking at this number here, the control unit, the control unit can figure out what the instruction is. So let's say the instruction is, for example, just for example, right? We haven't discussed on this yet, the assembly side of things, but let's say um, the instruction is somewhat like this, right? Add x3, x2, x1. And this instruction is essentially represented, let's say, as hex a, b, c, d. So this is like a mnemonic version, a human readable version, but this would translate into like a bunch of zeros and ones. And we'll discuss about this also when we discuss about the instruction set architecture. But let's assume that this instruction here is represented by hex ABCD. So now what will happen is reading the instruction buffer, 
the control unit will figure out that, oh, okay, I'm supposed to turn the addition functionality of the ALU and the CPU is supposed to somehow fetch x2 register value and x1 register value into the ALU. Let the ALU do the addition and then send the, the computed value, the addition value back to uh, the register x3. All right. So as a result of this instruction, then x2 and x1, the values got added and the content got put in register x3. So now what we have not discussed about yet, what I did not tell you about is how did the value in x2 and x1 come in and what will happen to the value in x3. That's again for later discussion when we talk about the instructions at architecture. But know that the way instructions are fetched and processed is that the CPU floats the address, an instruction arrives and arrives into the instruction buffer then it is essentially decoded by the control unit and other logic within the CPU and an action is performed. So the, the, just the process of decoding it, okay. so just the process of decoding it and making sense of the functionality here, that's called the decode phase or decode stage. And once the instruction is decoded, actual operation gets done. And that actual operation, when it gets done, that's called the execute phase or stage. So the CPU then typically operates in three stages, right? It's called the fetch in which it is floating the address and getting the data back, data meaning the instruction back from the memory. Then there is a decode phase. And the third one is the execute phase. So fetch, decode, execute are the typical three stages. There are more stages that we'll come to um, later, but these are the primary three stages that one should know. And why is this important? So when we reason about our C code, we would want to understand how the CPU is operating on that instruction, right? And going forward, we'll also kind of, you know, go ahead and prove the point that every assembly instruction like this translate into zeros and ones in the memory, right? Okay, cool. So, um, there was one other thing that I wanted to mention, which is the program counter. So the program counter as a register, um, something that every engine, uh, embedded engineer should know. So the program counter always points to the instruction that it is going to fetch next, right? So once it has, you know, once the CPU has fetched the zeroth uh, the instruction on the zeroth address, the program counter value will increment by the instruction size. And in this case, the instruction size that I have assumed is four bytes. So every time it fetches an instruction, it will increment the program counter by four, right? And now let me just introduce this idea towards the, uh, towards the end of this video, which is the program counter, if you manipulate that, you can take jumps. So for example, you have the memory, you have the CPU. If somehow, so the program counter, first off, is going to increase in the linear fashion by plus four after every instruction is executed. But now if you somehow make it increment or decrement, by some X amount, then you can essentially make the CPU fetch instructions that are away and, you know, different from the linear flow. The program could be executing linearly and then you can make the CPU jump to some other, uh, other location and skip certain instructions. So this is the idea of branching. We'll come to this uh, later, but I'm just kind of, you know, providing the seed of the idea right now. 
So this is called branching or uh, jumping, right? So what we have seen in this video then is we modified uh, the model of the CPU and memory interaction. Then we said that the CPU executes, uh, or rather CPU operates in three phases, fetch, decode, and execute. Fetch being that it floats the address, gets the instruction, decode meaning it understands what it needs to do, and execute is that it actually performs the execution. And then in the next video, what we'll do is uh, we'll kind of explore a little more of uh, how instructions are. We'll enter into the world of uh, ISA, which is the instruction set architecture. And then from there, we'll jump into assembly and then we'll make our uh, journey towards C. So yeah, hopefully this video was helpful to you and uh, I'll see you in the next video.